Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we are once again in the SWS Kodiak 100, rocking the Idaho Air Service paint scheme. Today's flight is going to be a tutorial flight. Um, I am not a pilot, so this is not intended for instructional purposes. This is purely what I do following a checklist. I got off the internet for free. And just what I've learned over the course of flying this thing for about 20 hours or so. What I've learned, it does well and does not do well according to my setup. So for this tutorial flight, we're going to leave here, beautiful Sandpoint, Idaho, and go to Nelson, which is in Canada. I think it's in Alberta, Canada. I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong down below in the comments. Uh, this can be a visual flight. As you can see, the weather today is quite nice. So we're going to go ahead and start walking out to the aircraft and head out on our way. See, this is a great aircraft. I, I highly enjoy this one. So now that we've climbed up in the cockpit, uh, we'll start going through just the general procedures. Um, in the video, I'll probably do it in the top right. I'll go ahead and try and take screenshots of the checklist and get that put in here so if you want to follow along you can. For the checklist I'm using JD's checklist for the Kodiak. I got it off of flightsim.to and so we're just going to go ahead and follow it straight down and we're going to start with before starting the engine. So with that we're going to check our fuel and load. Fuel load we got a total of 750 pounds on board the aircraft. Just me and the co-pilot. We got 55 pounds in the back. We're at 5,295 pounds, well below our maximum takeoff. And it also keeps us in our CG limits. Pre-flight inspection, we'll say the co-pilot went ahead and did it. Shocks, if you take a look, are in. Once you take the parking brake off, they disappear. So for now, they're going to be in. We'll say the ground crew will take care of that later on. Cabin doors we're going to leave open for right now. He is sitting on a seatbelt, but we'll go ahead and lock him in. And we're going to lock ourselves in. So I'm going to come in. So we'll continue to move on the, down the line. we got our parking brake set. It's pulled out here. And the pedals are pushed in. Master switch goes on. Now we can see everything's firing up. We hear the avionics cooling going on in the background. I'll turn our avionics on. Nav lights. And now we want to go ahead and test the bypass. So as you can see right now, it's underneath alternate alternator fail. We can see engine inlet norm flip this switch up it's going to take some time but that should show a bypass it does take some time so while we're waiting we will go ahead and bring the shutoffs down into the green and our firewall shutoff gets pushed into the dash submerged power is set to normal throttle is idle Feather prop is feathered, and our condition lever is off. Laps are up. Circuit breakers are all pushed in. We do not need internal lights. Our cabin cabin is set to off, and our oxygen panel works. So we we'll go ahead and test the stall speed. Stall, stall, stall. And we're good there. So you can see now it says engine inlet bypass. So that system is working. Go ahead and flip that off. And now we see it say normal. So with that, now we can move into the starting engine checklist. So the first thing we want to do is let's turn this one on. 
come in here to engine, go to the system page, we'll check our bus. Right now we have 25 volts and we need a minimum of 24 for start. So we are good there. And now that we're ready to start, let's go ahead and close our co-pilot's door. And it's latched. Close ours. And it's latched. All right, so now we'll go ahead and turn our beacon on. Our prop area is clear. All right, so now, so now is where you can do things different. A high start, according to the checklist, a high start is preferred, but a low motor start should be used at the first start after maintenance or when no ground power is available. Today, we don't have ground power. We're purely off the battery, so we're going to be doing a low start. So for that, we want to go ahead and turn the aux pump into the on position. Then for a low motor start, we want to go ahead and turn the ignition on. Now, before we fire up the starter, this will happen pretty fast, so we'll go over it now. So right here on the gauge, next to our map, underneath the navs, we see torque, ITT, NP, and NG. We do not want to introduce fuel until NG reaches 14%. As it accelerates through that, then we can introduce the fuel. And once we do that, we're going to be looking at the fuel flow. We want to see between 80 and 100 pounds per hour. Which I'll have to change systems there. So for our fuel flow, we want to see... So right underneath fuel, it says flow, PPH. We want to see that between 80 and 110. We want to make sure our ITT, second gauge below torque, does not exceed 1090. We want to see that once the start's complete, our NG is at a minimum of 52. So a lot of things can happen all at once. So with that, go ahead and put the starter into low. Now we see NG coming up through 5 already. There's 10, 12, and 14. Goes up to low idle. Now with that, we can see we're above 80. ITT's coming up through 600. And it peaked at about 661, the fuel flow is 105, and we got NG above 52. So with that, we can go ahead and turn the starter to off. Ignition goes off. Props go up to max RPM. Then our ox pump can go to standby. And we can turn our generator and alternator on, as well as turn on the auxiliary bus, which gives us our temperature controls. So with that, I like to come into the second page, flip it to Fahrenheit. It would be nice if it could just automatically, if it could remember that I want it to be Fahrenheit, that would be nice. So let's go ahead and close that window so we can hear ourselves think a little. All right, so now the after start checklist. We need to work on our cabin heat, ventilation, and defrost, which we just did right down there. Now the altimeter. Looking at the METAR, we should be at 29.91, but we'll go ahead and turn up to what should be the sandpoint, which should be the sandpoint frequency on our nav one here, which, not nav one, on COM one. It's going to be 135425. All right, let's see if that works. We're showing one seven. We're showing two nine or nine or two. Okay. 
That works for me. So one one nine or six. So we'll be taking off runway two zero. Let's go ahead and put in the sandpoint frequency, which will be one two two seven. All right. So then, for the avionics, it is the default G1000. But I went and went through the marketplace, and they got a free upgrade to the G1000 NXI. Which, if you haven't gotten that, it's free. I don't even think it's it's a couple hundred megabytes. It's worth it. It is a huge upgrade over the, I guess, standard G1000. Uh, I really like this. So now we're going to go ahead and just go through it. I'll go through all the different options if you're not familiar with it during this tutorial. We got plenty of fuel to get to Nelson, so we can sit here and burn some for a couple minutes. You got your map options. That's this map right here. Um, if I remember right, there is a way to turn it off. I like having it in the middle. Um, I got it displaying traffic. It's going to be a topographic map relative terrain or next rad. I like the relative terrain option. Coming in here you can select your wind option. Uh, once we get moving it'll be easier to show you that. DME. Um, we're not going to be using any VORs today. Leave that down. Bearings we will use. I'm going to have this set to bearing 1 set to the ADF for sandpoint. We're going to set bearing 2 to our GPS track which we'll set up. You can set your units, which I did not want to do that. Then coming into CDI, we'll set that to GPS. And here's where we can put in our ADF for Sandpoint, which is going to be 264. So zero, two, Six, four, then hit enter to transfer. That should eventually pop up. And there it is right there. So we've got a 1-7 bearing to the Sandpoint ADF. Under this is going to be a, VO, VO, a VFR flight today. Words are hard. And we're going to just turn that to on for right now. We'll do our best to remember to turn it to altitude later on. Then we come into our timers, which will start, not right now, but before we take off. Uh, looking at our performance data, our glide speed, we'll go ahead and just keep this 97. Our VR is going to be 60 knots. Coming in here for VX, I like to set this to 67. And then our VY is going to be 93. And where I got these numbers from, they're not just something I made up. They're, they're something an app made up, actually. Um, I have an Android phone. And on the App Store, there's a performance calculator app for the Kodiak. And that's what I'm using for this. I put in all the information, weight and balance, everything. And it gives you these numbers. It'll give you your takeoff data, so your torque settings, your maximum torque settings, performance, METAR, best runway. Uh, really good app. I have no clue if it's accurate because I've, I'm just a student pilot, and it's been many years since I've flown an airplane. And we're talking Piper Arch and Cessna 172s. So definitely not Kodiaks. So where I got those numbers, 67 is our our clean stall speed and our it's actually our stall speed and our takeoff configuration. It's 1.3 times our takeoff config stall speed. And the 93. Well it should be 98, I can't read my own handwriting. That is what it says. A VY. It's 98 knots. Minimums, we're not going to use that today. We got 
all that set up. You can also see your nearest airports or any alerts, which we don't have any. I usually leave this screen up. Setting your navs and your comms is normal for the G1000. And then moving over here. Let's go back. You got your engine screen. This gives you a lot of great new information. See detailed engine. Detailed system. Really nice. I like the lean page personally. I don't know what a lot of these options are. It's just how I use it. So now we'll go across to the flight plan setting and get that started. So if you haven't used the NXI before, you're not going to have any luck. You can spin this all day and nothing will happen. You got to pop it down right underneath each one to actually put things in. So we are at Sandpoint, which is K S Z T. It's in here somewhere. And runway, we're going off runway two zero based on the winds. So this is going to be a visual flight plan. We're just going to kind of follow the valley up all the way to Nelson. But just for the sake of putting something in to show you guys just how to do it, um, I did come up with a couple waypoints. This one is going to be a waypoint called... I can't even pronounce this to be honest. English is not my specialty even though it is the only language I know. It's going to be A. R. H, and we got an I, followed up by a Y. Alright, that's our waypoint. Shows that it is a bearing of 8 degrees and 27 miles away. That's the one we want. So, after that one, we're going to Bardu, which is B. O. If you hear any weird grunting going on in the background, that would be my dog. Uh, she was recently at dog daycare while I was on a work trip, and one of the dogs had kennel cough. And today is the first day since then that she's been doing a lot of coughing. So if you hear any weird grunting, that is what's going on. I'm not sure if the mic's actually picking it up or not. So this waypoint I got off a little nav map apparently does not exist. So we're going to move on to the next one. Which, if you haven't heard of little nav map, um, it's a fantastic program. I showed a little bit of it in my last video at the beginning. And it's an awesome program. I really like it. Um, I like the logbook feature. It is a lot better than Microsoft's logbook. That's for sure. But some of the waypoints in them, I don't know what nav database they're using, but they apparently don't exist. And I have a feeling this one's going to be one that doesn't exist either. Yeah. Well, we at least have one if nothing else works. Put in this last one. Yeah, so my dog was at dog daycare, and a dog had kennel cough, and now she has a cough. But she's doing good. Just needs to sleep it off. Alright, so we at least got the first and the last waypoint. So that that'll be handy. And once again, you got to scroll down underneath the title. Then Nelson is the is C because it's in Canada. Then Z in L. And based on the weather in Nelson which 
it should be according to that flight planning app well the performance app I was telling you about for the Kodiak that'll also give you your METARs the weather is two hours old so that it could be wrong lock and change in two hours should be runway 22 because we're looking at one the wind coming from 150 at 8 knots go ahead and put it in 22 for now that'll be our game plan one thing that's cool if your airport has it um, if your airport or waypoint has it the weather will show up right down here at the bottom of the flight plan section which is super cool and super handy that we got our flight plan entered now we'll go ahead and get the autopilot semi set up so we're taking off runway 20 I'm not sure the exact heading I think it might be along the lines of 203 so we'll go ahead and put that in for now and we're gonna go up to 7500 feet on this flight today Seventy five hundred feet. That's how we're gonna plug in for now. And so with the, that all done, now we can go ahead and check the flight controls. Let's plug those in. So first we look off the left. We see that elevator come down. Oh look, he's giving us a thumbs up. Like, yeah man, it's moving. Then come over here. See uh our, our co-pilot here is in the way of the aileron, so can't see it. Now, pull back. We can see the elevator move both directions, and it doesn't feel like there's any obstructions in our rudder movement. Flight controls are free and correct. Now we'll go ahead and turn the taxi light on. the parking brake and we'll start heading down to where we can do our run up so as we taxi I'm gonna go ahead and do a shameless plug for the channel here um, I'm a new youtuber so I still got a lot to learn if you see anything in the videos that I could do better please leave a comment down below that would help me make the videos better for you guys to watch and just kind of figure out what I'm doing. If you do like the videos, please like them, comment that I'm doing a good job, make me feel better. Um, and if you really want, subscribe. As you'll see right now, this will be video number three, and it's all the Kodiak. I do plan on venturing out from the Kodiak at some point in time. Just right now, I'm having a good time flying this airplane. It's it's really fun to fly if you haven't had the chance to fly it. Uh, I do have the Flysim Wear 414 and the PMDG DC6, which are also fun to fly and I plan on featuring at some point in time. But right now I'm having a lot of fun with the Kodiak. So we're probably going to keep flying it for a little bit, but I'll try and get some different aircraft in here for you guys. One thing that is to note about the Kodiak, even with at low idle, this thing will is more than willing to taxi itself just wherever you need it to go. For so then now we do need to do our run up. The good news is it's Sandpoint, so I don't think we're going to come across too many people. So we're just going to flip around here, do our best to not make, have an accidental runway incursion point ourselves the best we can into the wind. So we got our parking brake set. Now we'll go to our before takeoff run up checklist. Parking brake is set. Next thing down is check the flight controls again. Now we can look at the shadow. There's that aileron, which I can't remember, but I might have called it an elevator earlier because words are hard. And right there, there's our elevator hard at work. And rudder felt like there were no obstructions. Our flight instruments are still looking beautiful. 
All right, so now we want to go ahead and set our trims. What I've noticed for this airplane is you put this line about parallel with the ground. That seems to be a perfect nose forward trim. And now that I said that, it'll probably be wrong for this flight. So I want to come give it some rudder trim, which this plane is very, very rudder heavy. Especially on takeoff. So if we look down here underneath our fork, ITT, NP, and NG, down at the very bottom, there's aileron and rudder trim. I do not have this down to a science, and I will probably be wrong because I'm trying to make a video. But I think that will be too much. That's still probably a little bit too much. We're going to try that. And it will probably be not correct. Let's see what happens. So now we get our trim set. Now our separator. This little guy we tested earlier. So, for bypass... So actually now we want to test the system. I was a little early, earlier apparently. So now we're going to wait for that to go up to where we see engine inlet norm. I want to see that say BP again. It probably doesn't take that long in actuality. It doesn't take that long in actuality, but it always feels like forever. It says BP will put that back down to normal. And now for our power level. So now I want to bring the throttler, throttle up to 300 on the torque, which will be that top left gauge there underneath the nav. So most of my flights, I never do the run-up. I'm pretty much only doing it for the tutorial here for in case you want to do the run-up. I normally skip it, not going to lie. So now, now we're up to 300. I'm going to come look, and we got 26 volts, so that is good. So now we want to go ahead and press, the, press and hold the overspeed governor. governor says advance we want to advance the power level and check that rpms stable around 2000 stabilize around 2000 watching that np and see this is what i've noticed it always goes to the maximum so now we're seeing about 2200 instead of 2,000. Release it. And we're still seeing that 2,200. I've never gotten that test to actually work as supposed to. So for that test, we bring it back down to idle. And now we can taxi on down to the end of the runway and do our before takeoff. So at least the parking brake. And let's get flip back around. So this is a free scenery for Sandpoint, it's not the default. I got it off of flightsim.to. It's a pretty nice scenery, gives you a gate that I think, pretty sure they said was designed to fit a CRJ, like a CRJ 200. It gives you a gate if you want to fly an airliner in here. I think it works out perfect for the fake airline that I for the most part, fly for um, Idaho Air Service. It seems to be perfect for coming in and having a little makeshift gate to park at and drop off to virtual passengers. So now that we're here at the runway, got the parking brake set. 
go through the before takeoff checklist. So after parking brake set, we're going to go ahead and turn that aux fuel pump back on. Verify fuel selectors are on, seat belts are in the locked position. Farm walls pushed into the, to the panel. Fuel quantity looking good, we're in the green. Flaps um, for this takeoff. We're just going to go ahead and do a normal takeoff. We're not going to use any flaps today. Short field takeoff would be 20 degrees flaps. Elevator trim is set. Rudder trim is set. And we are not messing with the aileron trim. I've never been able to figure it out. Our bypass is going to stay in normal as there's no visible moisture and it is above 4 degrees centigrade. Pedo system will be, the pedo static system will be turned off. Actually, the pedo static heat will be turned off because it is above 4 degrees centigrade. ATC clearance, um, it's an uncontrolled field, no one's been broadcasting. We're not going to go ahead and broadcast. For the most part, I did not use the default Microsoft ATC. But our radios are set so we can hear if anyone decides they want to come in. Our is 2, 9 or, and 9 or 2, so we're good there. Autopilot is set transponder. It's set to altitude. I remembered today. Usually I always forget that in the on position. I like to have the landing lights on pulse. So that's what we're going to set them on. Taxi light can go off. Strobe lights can go on. And we can go ahead and bring the mixture, well, our fuel control lever to max. And with that, we are ready for takeoff. So for the takeoff, we're going to line up, pull the brakes, verify everything is set. We're going to slowly apply power until we get to our maximum torque. We're going to release the brakes, check our instruments, and rotate at 60 knots. Which for this takeoff, our maximum torque is going to be 1,633. If you wanted to do a short field takeoff, we'd have 20 degrees flaps in. You'd hold the brakes, verify all your instruments, slowly bring in the power until you get to your maximum torque, rotate at 60, lift off, climb about 73, and bring your flaps up as you climb out. So just because everything happens really fast, we'll go ahead and go over our climb checklist. So once we get stabilized in the climb, we'll go ahead and bring the flaps up. In this case, they're already up. Y'all damper will go on. Ox pump will go to standby. We'll check and see if we need our pedo heat. Check and see if we need our separator. And that is it. We're, we're going to climb at 110 knots. And we're going to leave the props at 2200 RPM and a pretty much maximum torque. And so with that, we will go ahead and head on to the runway. And you can kind of see them. Uh, you might not be able to see it, but if you look just slightly left of the windsock, you can see our pulse lights pulsing. And I just realized, Sandpoint, this is not the full runway. Because we're in Sandpoint, and you can't taxi to the end. So we are actually are going to do a short field takeoff now. So get those set down to 20. By the way, my friends, that is called poor planning because I'm making a video and don't want to mess up. We're going to make mistakes, but it happens. With this, here's where we're going to start our timer because according to the operating handbook for the real airplane, you're only supposed to use your takeoff power for no more than five minutes. So go ahead and click start. Now we'll slowly bring that power up to takeoff. So 
So we're watching that first gauge below the nav comp, before the nav panel. Just looking to bring that up to 1630, we said was our maximum. Right about there. So now we'll get rolling. We're going to put in some more right rudder. Now we have too much right rudder. Alright, so then there is 60, so we're pulling back. Pull that up. So now we want to climb up at about 73. I like to climb up until we get about 500 feet above the ground. Like I said, this airplane needs a lot of right rudder. It can be a handful to manage sometimes. We're about 500 feet, so now we'll go ahead and pitch down. 85 knots will bring the flaps up to 10. 85. Then 95 will bring up final notch flaps, so we're clean. Then we're going to aim to climb at about 110. Alright, there's 110, so now we'll go ahead and start turning on course. Make a right hand turn. That clicking is the trim controls when I go through my joystick. I don't know why it does that. So for the climb, I am looking to maintain 115 to 110. I'm not looking to be right on the money. As long as we're in that ballpark, we're good to go. Alright, and so just to make things a little bit easier, we will go ahead and set the autopilot heading and pitch, gauge, get the yaw damper turned on, and put in our vertical speed up to our altitude select. We can probably do about 1500. Give it a little bit of left rudder. And with that, we can bring our aux pump to standby. We still do not need pedo, heat, or the bypass, so we're good there. Now we're going to climb. Which we're three minutes in. Um, our takeoff power, our torque's already come down. But we'll go ahead and switch up our climb profiles on the fly here. So bring the torque down a little bit because we're going to change the and change the prop. We're going to bring the prop down to 2,000. That's too much. Alright, and so for climb, climb with a prop set to 2,000 RPM. What are we going to be looking at here? We're going to be looking for, for about 1840. Which 1840 is too high for our NG, so we'll bring that back down below 101.6, which is the maximum. And our speed's getting a little slow, so let's knock that down to 1200 feet per minute. Now we're coming up on our planned route, so we'll go ahead and switch this over to nav. That way it'll just pick up our flight plan. And then once we get flying in the valley, we're going to have, we can't just go direct to our final waypoint because we'll fly into the terrain. So we'll go ahead and give it manual heading changes at that point in time. Maybe even do some hand flying, we'll see what happens. 
So we come to 7500, we can go through the cruise checklist. So for that, we're going to go ahead and want our double check our pedo system. So pedo heat can stay off, we're still above 4 degrees. Our bypass can stay off because we're still above 4 degrees and there's no visible moisture where we're at. Oxygen is not required. And then now coming into our performance app. So we're going to be want to be at 2000 RPM and 75% power, which will be 1242 on the torque. Bring that way back. And it looks like we need a little bit more left rudder. Let's see what that does. Well, that looks like it might have fixed a problem. So we do need to bring the prop back just a smidge, because we're at 2010 on the, on the prop RPM. And we can also go ahead and stop that timer. We'll reset it. We're going to use that anymore. Oh, well, actually, let's go ahead and put in our landing speeds. So landing speeds. So for this, for VR, I like to put our slowest speed, which is going to be our clean stall speed. In that case it's 64. Above that, it's going to be 65. Then after that is going to be 84. Which, once again, the these numbers are not made up numbers. They're numbers I got from the performance app that I was talking about. And what those numbers are, so 64 is 1.3 times our landing configuration stall speed. 65 is 1.3 times our takeoff configuration stall speed. Then 84 is 1.3 times our clean stall speed. VREF is 64 knots. That's where those came from, in case you're wondering. We'll go ahead bring our throttle back just a smidge and it looks like we need probably one maybe two clicks of left rudder just to balance us out so with that we are airborne so now we're gonna have some free time which depending how much free time we have I might just cut out this middle part that you guys probably don't want to watch but maybe I'll say something interesting that we can all laugh at me later, so we'll find out what happens. So, looking at our flight plan, as I said, we're going to fly the valley. This right here, where you see our first waypoint, to our last waypoint, just to the left of that, is the valley. This would be a lot better to show you if the mouse would record, but I have not figured out how to record my mouse. I know it's a setting, I just don't know where that setting is. But if you see, if you see runway 20, where we left that sandpoint, going up to our high, that's my best guess. Right in front of us. To the left of that, there's that green that you can see sneak between the mountains and eventually becomes water. And that's where we're going to be. And we're not going to make it all the way up to Leaf Hall. We're not going to go that far because we're just going to fly this curve, come straight in, we'll fly over the airport, turn around, coming in and land on runway 2 too. And so, if you haven't flown with the NXI before, some of the other stuff I didn't talk about is if you take the big wheel here, and turn it, you can just turn to different things, like you can go to waypoints, you can go into your your auxiliary page where you can change a whole bunch of settings in it. I wish there were more things you could change, but it's still a huge improvement. Go to your flight plan, go to your nearest, nearest, then with the small knob you can go to nearest airports, intersections, NDB, VOR, super awesome and it's the same if you say come to waypoint just start switching around for a map it's really cool um, it took me way too long to switch to this now that I did I wish I would have done it sooner so I'm telling you if you haven't done it 
I would highly recommend it. It blows the default G1000 out of the water. It is false, far, 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 far superior of a system. And I guess as long as this is a tutorial of the aircraft, I guess we should go over a couple of things, just so you know. So with this aircraft, if you turn on some of the extra systems, it does draw from your torque and from your engine power. So that's why we don't just want to leave the pitot heat on all the time, or leave it in bypass, or have the aircraft air conditioning on all the time, because it does draw from our power. So if we're landing on a really short airstrip where we need to get out of there and we need every drop of power this thing can give us, we need air conditioning off. You're going to have to have the bypass on, so you're going to lose some power there. And if you can, have your pitot heat off because you're going to need every ounce of power. So up here at climb, your max torque reduction, torque reduction if you have your bypass turned on, it's going to be 140 foot-pounds. If your pitot heat's turned on, you're going to lose a maximum of 10 foot-pounds. And if your air conditioning is on, you're going to lose a maximum of 80 foot-pounds. So to show you that, if we look at our torque, we're currently sitting at 1250. Which, before I get too far ahead of myself, let me make sure, I'm going to turn this to heading so we don't fly ourselves into a mountain while I'm chatting it up here. Because that would be a really bad way to film this video is, oh look, we crashed. Gonna have to do a little bit of zigging and zagging here at first, but that's okay. Um, oh yeah, so if we see our torque's at 1250, so if I come in here and I just turn these off, we can now hear that this system went off. And we should start seeing that torque come alive. Okay. I, I know this works. This is like when your car has a problem. And then you take it to the shop. And it won't do the problem. Like my work car, for instance. It makes a weird noise every now and then when you drive it. I take it to the shop. They say it's fine. Then something on it breaks. They fix it. And I'm like, oh sweet, it shouldn't make weird noises when I drive anymore. It still does, in case you're curious. It still makes weird noises. But apparently nothing's wrong with it. Oh, thanks Ford. Okay, so it's not doing what I want to show you, so we'll go ahead and turn the bypass on, because that will for sure do what I want to show you. So as you can see, we, we now instantly see that torque dropping. We've already dropped 30 pounds, now 40 foot-pounds, 50, and it's continuing to go down. All because we switched to bypass, and we can start to see that speed reduction. So now we've lost 100 foot-pounds, 110. Now you can see that speed really dropping off. Well, there's 140, 150. That's a, looks like we must have a problem because the maximum is supposed to be 140. But it is using round numbers, so maybe it's accurate. I don't know. I'm not an expert. So go ahead and put that back to normal because we do not need it. It's only 12 degrees and there's visual, visible moisture, but once again, it's only 12 degrees, so we are good to go. Go ahead, flip this heading to just shoot us straight down. What's about the middle? We're going to skirt around this, but we got plenty of altitude to afford that. That looks like that should be a pretty good heading. So this airplane is really fun to fly. We're just gonna come down the middle here. One thing that's neat is when you start putting weights in these seats, you'll actually get people to appear. There's a minimum weight. So we 
I'm being lazy and not wanting to hold down three keys while moving the mouse and filming at the same time. So you get to see this beautiful carpet. So we're only 55 pounds back here. Apparently that's not enough weight to put some boxes in the back, but as you put in weight in the different sections on the fuel manager, it will actually put in boxes and people. If you use the cargo configuration or I want to say it's called mixed. Um, it'll actually put in like boxes of cargo, which is pretty cool. It's a very neat system how they have it set up. I, I like that a lot. And if we switch to the outside view, um, it'll actually show you those extra passengers and boxes in the external view. So you'd be able to see them from the window like you can see me and the co-pilot right here. which just like most aircraft in the 70s days if we there we go if we bring that down and let's just flip his off to the side you can actually see those modeled in the game which is pretty cool in their positions um, one thing that'd be a nice improvement is if they went to kind of how Flysim has it on their 414 where you can actually like grab that little red knob slide it forward backwards angle it, flip it around, and really customize the position. That would be really nice to see in the aircraft. I really like that about the 414. Which hopefully will make a 414 video here for you guys soon. Um, if you haven't seen the 414 from Fly Somewhere, um, it, it's a really good aircraft. It is still in beta. They seem to be updating it on what feels like a weekly basis. It's probably not, but at least they're putting a lot of work into it, and it flies nice. It looks really nice. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of the EFB, but it at least has an EFB if you're interested in, in that. The Kodiak does not have an EFB. Um, I'd like to see an EFB more like what PMDG has done for their, their DC-6. Or I like the one that's also on the Aerosoft CRJ. Those are all, all pretty nice EFBs, but it, it is nice to see a GA airplane getting a decent EFB. And through that, on the 414 is how you like open all your doors and everything. But I'll have to do another video on that so that we're not destroying this video talking about a whole different airplane. Um. I will say, the Kodiak here is a phenomenal plane. I really like the work that these guys put into it. And I think it shows. I enjoy flying it, but I enjoy flying the little prop planes. So, as you can see, I mainly talk about the DC-6, the 414, and the Kodiak. That's what I enjoy flying. Um, unless I magically get one, you're not going to see me fly the 737 or any of that stuff. I'm not going to spend the money on it. But if you do see like any cool GA, GA airplanes or old prop liners, um, throw them in the comments. I'd, maybe it's one I haven't heard of. I'd love to check it out. Once again, I'm new to YouTube. If, if you don't like this little ramble I'm doing in the middle, let me know. I, I can take the criticism. Um, if you if you do like the rambling, let me know. I'll be sure to not cut them out in my next couple videos. But if there's any aircraft you would like to see, um, whether that's a review or a tutorial, or you just want to see someone flying it because there's like no one flying it around on YouTube, throw it in the description. I'll see what I can do, that's for sure. But... If you haven't flown the Kodiak, I want to say it's, I think it's like $40. I'm not entirely sure what it costs anymore. I bought it when I when it first came out. But if you don't want to spend the full price, which I get, um, definitely I would say if it's on sale and you can do it, I'd highly recommend it. it it's a good airplane. Uh, through the updates, they've made a lot of really good changes to it. 
and they've really been refining it to be better and better. One of the things they did in the most recent update is how on startup we had to make sure we didn't introduce the fuel before NG got to 14. That's because if you introduce the fuel too soon, you can actually cause a hot start, and they modeled that in the game. Also, if you keep the engine over torque or outside of its limitations for too long, they supposedly modeled it to actually have like engine failures because you're exceeding the limitations of the engine. So it's all really nice stuff that I like to see. Because for the most part, I'm just flying around, trying to keep do my best to fly it semi-realistic, but have a good time at the at the same time. I'm sure there's things I'm doing wrong, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I think flight sim is about having a good time, and if a good time is following the checklist to a T, running it like an airline pilot. Awesome. If it's taking the Kodiak trying to do barrel rolls, which I haven't done. Let me know if it can do barrel roll rolls. I have not tried it. Uh, that's awesome too. I, I always like to say you do you. I think that's the best way to go about doing business. Is do what makes you happy in life. Man. That is Tyler's TED Talk for the day. Do you and what makes you happy. That that's what matters in life, is that you're happy. Oh. And this aircraft, it makes me happy to fly. Just like the CRJ. People kind of hate on the CRJ because it's old and not updated. I like flying it. It's a good plane. This Kodiak is a really good plane. Uh, doing more of like a review type thing, you can actually grab these little air vents and you can you can turn them, close them off. And depending on what you do, like so we've left this off now, we can see that the cabin temperature has changed to one degree. It will actually simulate based on how many passengers you have in the plane, how the cabin would change, and also how fast you would use your oxygen. All that changes based on how many people you have in the aircraft, which is kind of cool that they modeled that. We're going to go ahead and turn that back on. And one of the things I don't understand is we zoom in here. So there we got our panel switches that I'm lighting up right now. And then we got our oxygen ELT. We got our flight time and our block time gauge. I don't know where it got 83 hours from. I have not flown this plane this long. The 20.3 hours, I believe. But the 83.1, I don't know where that came from. Probably one of my only complaints about this aircraft. Also, if you see the takeoff torque cards right there, so between this vent I'm moving and compass deviation, that's your takeoff maximum engine torque placard. And down here, you have just some basic takeoff and landing speed references. That is a mod I found on flightsim.to. Real easy, just drop in the community folder and it adds it in there. Kind of nice. Uh, now that I found that app, I don't really reference them anymore, but it's still a nice thing to have if you just need to take a quick look up. Oh, I know I weigh 5,500 pounds, or pretty close to that. Takeoff should be about 55, landing should be about 64. Or, once again, going into your takeoff, say if you don't have the app, or you don't want to use the app, or if they don't make it for iPhone, I don't know. We can hear be like, oh, well, I know it's 20 degrees, I'm at sea level. And then boom, right there. Now you got your max torque for 2200 RPM for takeoff. Really sweet. Oh, another thing, as long as you're on the topic of the vents, doing a 
like mock shift review now. These ones in the back cabin move as well. Which kind of neat. All of them do. Uh, I can't tell if I was able to grab that one in the back or not. But the other thing, you can come in here, click the little button between the light and the vent, and it'll turn the light on. Since it's daytime, uh, we can't see that the light turns on, but I promise you it does. This is how you control your overhead light. Turn it on, turn it off. And you can also move it, which is kind of cool. So if you want it closer up the panel, further down, you can just move it wherever you want. Pretty neat little light. Uh, here's another vent that we apparently turned off at some point in time. And I can't remember, but I think it saves the state of these vents. I'm going to turn them all in and out, and next time I fly the airplane, I'll see if they move. If I remember to check for that keyword. So taking a look, um, we're currently zoomed out to about, that should be 15 miles, so we're probably, yeah, we're probably about 30 or 40 flight miles from the airport, would be my guess. It says we, it would take us 10 minutes to get to La Fall, but we're not going to go there. We're just going to fly right past it. We're going to fly right past it and away from it, because that's how we do business here. So now we'll go ahead and start looking at our descent checklist, just to kind of stay ahead of the aircraft. So, for descent, we're going to want to check, see if we need our pedo heat, which it's 11 degrees. We do have visible moisture now, but it's still 11 degrees. We're going into our separator. Once again, we're above 4 degrees. If there is visible moisture. I don't think we'll need it. So, radios and avionics. So it looks like, based off what I read on the internet, which I used Skyvector for these, and Skyvector, in America at least, doesn't have a lot of Canadian information. If I read it right, it looks like their version of like a center is going to be on 123 decimal. 475 and the Unicom frequency for where we want for Nelson is going to be 123 decimal 2 so we got those plugged in oh, let's see if this actually says we tuned anything says not in use. What if we swap that? Okay, so that is indeed Nelson. So we're just going to leave that on Nelson so that we can hear if anyone is flying into the airport before we just come Baja in and land however we feel like it. And so how we were talking about we this little map so I have it on relative terrain. So as you can see, as we zoom out, it takes our altitude and shows us the terrain relative to our position, which I think is pretty cool. If you don't like that, you can do just a topo map, or you can do a next rad radar. I personally prefer the relative terrain. I think it's super awesome. Depending on where I'm at and how fast I'm flying, what altitudes, I change this distance. We'll leave it at 5 for now. And earlier, I was talking about... That's not what I wanted. Um, there we go. Things are hard. Um, how the wind. So if we see our speed tape, our true airspeed, 156, then we see that little diagonal arrow, 2 knots, that's our wind speed. We can change that, so there's option 1, option 2, and option 3. 
I just like option one. I don't really care to know what the heading is. I just like to see the little picture and the number. If you don't like seeing the outside air temperature in Celsius, if we come over here to Ox, and, oh, now I gotta remember how to do this. There we go, yeah, so for me, it's a left click, right push. So hold the left mouse button in, push the right mouse, will get you for that to flash up. We can actually come in here and change our temperature to Fahrenheit, and now it says 52 degrees. But I just leave it on Celsius, because that's, for the most part, what our checklist goes off of. And it's really easy for me just to think, oh, 4 degrees, instead of trying to figure out what 4 degrees in Celsius is. Because I'm, I don't know. And then, so you push that left mountain in, right click, we'll get you back out of it. Bring that back out to the map. We're about 15 miles from our turn. Looking at what's ahead of us here. So we can see on the map, that where we want to turn to get to runway 22, the river jets left and then kind of jets back out to the right and makes a B. That's kind of what we're looking at right here. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say, for some reason, the terrain is not loading right. That doesn't look up to that mountain looks a lot better than this one. Well, that's going to ruin how pretty this approach is going to be. But, okay, not sure what the deal on that is. So, as we get ready to hand fly this, so we already went through our descent checklist. The airport is at 1,755 feet MSL. So, we'll probably plan on being at about 2,700 feet as we work our way down. We're going to hand fly it over to the airport. So, because this all happens kind of fast, so we'll go ahead and do our visual approach and landing checklist to include short field. AT Sea clearance we're monitoring. They do not have a tower, so we're good to go. We'll check our fuel valves. They are still set to open. Firewall is still pushed in. The firewall cutoff is still pushed in. Our auxiliary fuel pump is going to go on. Separator is not needed. Fuel condition is set to high. Prop will bring the high up on the descent. Landing lights are on. Harnesses are locked. Our flap speeds at 130, we're going to drop in 10 knots. At 130, we're going to drop in 10 degrees. At 115, we'll drop in 20. And at about 110, we'll give that final knock of flaps. For landing, which once I turn off the autopilot, we're going to go ahead and take the yaw damper off. And then we'll come in for our landing. In the event of a go around, we're going to bring the throttles pretty much up to maximum torque for our takeoff power. We're going to pitch for 75 to 80 degrees until we clear our obstacles. We're going to have our flap set to 20. Once we accelerate to 95, we'll pretty much resume a short field takeoff. And then get reestablished to come in for a second approach. So with that and our oddly loading terrain, as we can see that mountain on the left is like half loaded. We're coming up on our exit, and I'm going to just zoom this in real quick, and let's see what happens when we turn autopilot off. Let's see how bad this thing gets. Nice and trimmed. I love it. Alright, so we are drifting a little to the left, but that's okay. We want to work our way to the left. So I'm going to give it just a little bit of nose down because I want to start that descent. I'm going to keep power the same for now. 
I'll let us do a little bit of a fast approach. Looks like the mountain's starting to load off on our left wing, at least. Can't say the same about her nose, though. So if I remember right, the airport is going to be off our left wing, so we're going to try and fly over the right side of the river. That way we got plenty of space to check out the airport, try and see if we can find a windsock, verify that wind direction, verify the wind direction, and make sure runway 22 is still our best approach. I do not have a weather frequency, so we did the very accurate hotkey to the current altimeter setting. Because we, are, we, we strive for realism here on the flying photographs. And everyone knows in a real airplane, you can just break out your, your keyboard on your Blackberry and hit B. And you're good to go. Or I guess no one has a Blackberry anymore, so on your Garmin 750 or whatever, just hit the B key and it'll put in that altimeter for you. So we're about 15 miles from the airport now. We're still just going to maintain kind of a slow descent, high speed through the valley here. Just take in the scenery that has and has not loaded yet. I'll say this is a Microsoft Light Sim 2020. It is an awesome simulator. One of the things I both like and hate about it is the downloaded scenery. It's really nice because we do get this really pretty satellite imagery that has trees and buildings. But if you're like me and live in the middle of nowhere and your internet is really slow some days, it's terrible because you're flying around gorgeous scenery and then magically you just get somewhere because your Wi-Fi is being lame and now you don't have beautiful scenery anymore. Only real complaint. But... I guess you probably can't just have worldwide beautiful satellite imagery and and expect it to not need to download the internet sometime. So I guess it's a first world problem. And so here we are, we're gonna maintain Kind of right along the outer, the northern bank of the river. I'm not sure what river this is. If if you know what river it is, please let me know. I see we're get, kind of getting some clouds and coverage here, but they're way above where we are, so we got plenty of visibility to remain VFR. is a little turbulent and, all. and we're getting kind of some wind shear actually the wind direction keeps changing only by like one knot but the plane seems to be a little sensitive to that so as we get closer to the airport we're just going to go ahead and verify we got everything set up so we got master avionics auxiliary box pumps on generator alternator on beacon strobe nav landing is set to pulse cabins off no pedo or bypass needed everything is set to max so we are looking good for landing you can kind of see that nice relative terrain showing up underneath our attitude indicator now on the NXI. Right, and so it's blocked off by that pillar, but we should start to see Nelson here any second. And 
I have to come a little bit more to the left just to give us some more space. Well, to the right. Apparently, I do not know left and right. Alright, so on our left, I can definitely see a town. Now I'm looking for the airfield. We'll start reducing our power. Prop set to max. So reducing power to get some some flaps in and also work on bringing our altitude now that we're getting we're super close to Nelson. Now it looks like the terrain's loading pretty well. So maybe one of you guys have better eye eyeballs than I do, but I'm ha I'm not seeing the airport yet. Should be pretty close to right in front of us, right off the nose. I ha I did not test fly this before I did the video, so you and I are both flying this for the very first time. Once you've been here, then it's just me doing this for the very first time. So maybe it's around the bend. Or actually, is that it right there on the water? Or is that a road? Um, we'll just have to end up flying around the bend, I think, and see if we can't spot it. I'm not seeing a very airporty looking airport, though that kind of looks like it right there on the water. Looks like the... Yeah, that should be it right there on the waterfront. So let's make sure we don't fly into this hillside. And, oh yeah, that that's a runway. I will definitely not be able to see the windsock from up here. So, once again, we aim for realism here on the channel of the flying photograph, so we're just going to wing it. Kind of see where we need to be and where we want to be, so give ourselves a little bit more space to make this turn and get set up. So we're below 130, so we'll have that first notch of laps. Keep descending because we got about 1300 feet to the field. We'll go ahead, slow up, and make the turn as we go through 115 and notch 2. So 20 degrees of flaps. Then 105, we'll add our final notch. And we'll get down to 84 knots for our approach speed. And I just realized we said we're going to land on runway 22. We are no longer doing that. As you can tell, I put a lot of forethought into this flight. So once again, we strive for realism. So we're coming in, we're at 90 knots, a little fast. There, I got the runway, we're a little fast and a little high. But we, we can fix that, this is not our first time. We are expert VFR sim pilots. It looks like it's pretty calm, a little variable. That's good for us, landing on runway four. Then there's the fence line. Bring her up, bring that back. Bring the nose up, and touch down. 
Give it some reverse. I guess beta. Getting out of beta. And we'll turn around at the end. Actually, a very pretty approach. I like it here. I'm going to have to fly back. Uh, maybe next time we'll ran, land on the proper runway, too. But it worked out. Not much wind. Variable. Very variable wind. It's only like one or two knots, so not bad at all. But as we go back down the runway, we'll do the after landing checklist. Alright, so as we go down after landing, we want to bring our fuel down to low idle. Low oh, idle. Uh, taxi lights can go to the on position. Anyway, we'll leave it on for now. Strobes need to stay on. Bring our flaps up. Auxiliary pump can go off. Pedo heat and bypass can stay off. Go ahead and make sure we don't taxi off the end of the runway. Turn our air conditioning off. We'll open our window instead. And our transponder. We'll go ahead and turn that to on. Should have used some reverse instead of the brakes. Oh well. So turn off the runway. Turn off those. Turn off our strobes. And now let's find a place to park. Not much for parking here. Uh. Hmm. We'll go to our left. No one's parked over here. Uh, well, there's a plane now. I did not see that one a second ago. All right, we'll clear him. Let's try and flip, flip around without hitting anything. All right, and we'll set the park brake. All right, let's go now to our shutdown checklist. Parking brake is on, air conditioning is off. Auxiliary bus can go off. Power is brought back to idle. Prop will go to feather. And now we want to go ahead and set our timer for one minute, and we want to see everything stabilized during that minute. While that's happening, we go ahead and turn our generator and alternator off. Double check our ITT. We're going to at 540. We still got 45 seconds. 45 seconds to go. Take a look at the outside, see how well our park job went. Pretty decent. We, we maybe could have parked in front of that hangar. But, this worked out alright. We got ourselves here to Nelson. We can take a nice picture of the plane. Hop back in the sim. So we got 10 seconds to go. We're looking at 5.48, so I would say that's stabilized. There's one minute. So bring that down to cut off. Oxygen supply is off. Fuel selectors. Go off. While we're up here, we'll unlock our seatbelts. Avionics and Master can go... Well, hang on. Transponder, stand by. Now, Avionics and Master can go off. Lights can now go to off. Controls. 
are good. And then tie downs if we want them, which we're not going to tie her down. And there you have it. Here we are in Nelson. And we'll see you guys for the next one. If you like this video, please like, subscribe if you like me that much. Uh, please leave comments below. Um, I'll read them and respond the best that I can. I'll see you guys on the next one.